explain how an extraction works. So in an extraction, you have to look at solubility. So if you have a solution, so this is your solvent, we'll call it solvent one. And then there is all these solute molecules or atoms dissolved in solvent one. If you want to extract the solute from the solvent, you would add a second solvent. We'll call that solvent two. And the solute is more soluble in solvent two than in solvent one. So the extraction works by a difference in solubility of the solute in each solvent. Okay, so if the solute is more soluble in solvent two than solvent one, the solute will be extracted or removed into that second solvent. Okay. The other thing about an extraction is that solvent two is immiscible in solvent one. Okay, so that's why you saw those two layers. Okay. For question B, the structure of caffeine is shown below. Explain why a circle of functional groups. So a lot of you said that caffeine is aromatic, and that's true, it actually is aromatic, although we didn't talk about the criteria to uh, determine whether a substance is aromatic. Okay, so if you think we're getting a chemistry, we talk about the various criteria. There's actually four criteria. But anyway, what I look for is that there are two amine functional groups, there's two amine functional groups, and there's an alkene functional group. Okay, so I look for those three functional groups in caffeine. Explain why caffeine is soluble in water. Uh, caffeine is a molecular compound, so when caffeine dissolves in water, it forms a molecular solution. So what you want to look at are intermolecular forces, and you want to determine the specific intermolecular force between caffeine and water. And it turns out that the intermolecular force which exists between caffeine and water is hydrogen bonds. Okay, so if you listen to hydrogen bonds, you get, you get full credit for question B. Okay, are there any questions on question one? Okay, let's take a look at question two. So Pepsi soda contains 20 milligrams of sodium, 28 grams of sugar, and then some CO2. Diet Pepsi substitutes a small amount of nutrients for sugar. So is the boiling point of Pepsi greater than, less than, or the same as the boiling point of water? So note that the Pepsi contains solutes, which means it's a solution. And according to what we talked about in regard to colligative properties of solutions, a solute will raise the boiling point or elevate the boiling point of that solution compared to pure solvent. So the boiling point of Pepsi should be greater than the boiling point of water. And then you want to estimate the boiling point of water. A lot of you use the mass of sodium as a solute, although note that there's a lot more sugar than sodium in, in uh, Pepsi. Okay, so in that calculation, okay, so in that calculation, you you're given 20 milligrams of sodium, 28 grams of sugar, and then there's some CO2. There's, the mass wasn't given. Okay, so what you can do is convert from milligrams of sodium to moles of sodium. Uh, for the sugar, you can either say it's glucose, C6H12O6, or sucrose C12H22O, I don't really care, whichever one you use. And you convert to moles of sugar. And then you're not given the mass of CO2, so you can just leave this out. So what you would do is just take the total moles, divide this by the kilograms of solvent, and since the, since the volume uh, Pepsi is, uh, let's see, 8 ounces or 240 milliliters. You can assume that the mass of solvent is 0.24 grams, sorry, 0.24 kilograms, and this will give you the molality of the solution. So once you know the molality of the solution, you can use the formula delta Tb 
equals I times KD times N. And that will give you your boiling point elevation. And then add 100 to that number, and that gives you the boiling point of Epsom. Now, like I said, a lot of you use sodium, so you got, you got credit for doing that. If you use sugar, I give you credit for that. But if you use total moles, so you do this way, this is actually the correct way to do that. Okay. KB for water <coughs> is uh, 0.52. Then for the I value, since you're given sodium I, and we're not quite sure whether it's some sodium chloride or what sodium, you say I equals one for that, and I equals one for sugar, so you can use I equals two. I didn't really look at what your I value is, as long as you, as long as you explain that, you know, I is, I is for a lot of you use so, sodium chloride for the, for the sodium, so I equals two for the sodium chloride, and I equals one for sugar which means that the total I value equals three, so if you did that, that's fine. Part B, as Pepsi is heated, it loses mass, explain this observation. So you guys did this in lab, and when you did this, the Pepsi lost mass because as you heated it, what happened? Yeah, the CO2 comes out of solution. So as the temperature increases, okay, so as the temperature increases, the solubility of CO2 decreases. So as you heat it up, solubility, I mean, the CO2 comes out of solution, and that's why the Pepsi loses that. Part C, regular diet soda have the same sweetness. You put regular soda on one side of the semi pearl membrane, diet soda on the other. One soda tastes sweeter than the other after 30 minutes. Which one tastes sweeter? So I think almost everyone, almost all you guys got this, correct, got this question correct, that the diet soda should taste sweeter because based on osmosis, water should pass from the diet side into the regular soda side. Okay, so as a result, the concentration of the NutraSweet in the diet soda increases, the concentration of sugar in the Pepsi decreases, and that's why the diet soda tastes like that. Okay, now note again, in osmosis, it's water which passes through the semi-permeable membrane, not the solutes. Okay, so it's water only. Now if there's a different type of membrane, since it's a dialysis membrane, then it could be the the other small molecules such as sugar and salt and potassium and other other small ions and molecules. Okay, but again, in regular osmosis, it's only water which passes through the membrane. Okay, are there any questions on question uh, two? Okay, let's go on to question three on the next page. So circle of functional groups in salicylic acid, so there's the aromatic group, the alcohol group, and the acid group. And then draw the structure of the product of this reaction. So in this reaction, okay, so in this reaction we have the salicylic acid. This reacts with the one propene three all. So note that the acid group reacts with the alcohol group, and this is going to form our product. Okay, so this is our product. Note again that this part has three carbons in it, and. Um, Unfortunately, few of you miscounted the number of carbons when you're drawing your structure. So I knew you had the right idea, but I didn't write the right number of carbons in that side chain. Oh, then the other product is water. Part B, 
salicylic acid and one propene, three all, have carbon-carbon dull bonds. You measure the IR spectrum of each compound, this carbon-carbon dull bond peak in salicylic acid is a lower energy. And the carbon-carbon dull bond peak in one propene, three all. So IR spectroscopy is used to determine the bond types in a compound. So we're looking at the carbon-carbon dull bond in this molecule and the carbon-carbon dull bond in that one. Now this one has this one shows a lower energy in the IR spectrum because experiments show that the carbon-carbon bonds in the benzene ring are all the same length, which means that we actually need to draw a resonance structure. which represents the delocalization of electrons among the six carbons in that ring. Okay, so because of the delocalization of electrons, it turns out that the carbon-carbon bond in this one, so our carbon-carbon double -carbon bond is longer, longer, and it's also a weaker bond, whereas the carbon-carbon double -carbon bond here is shorter and it's actually a stronger bond. So since this is the shorter, stronger bond, it takes more energy to stretch it than to stretch the carbon-carbon belt bond in the benzene ring. Okay, so that's why this one has a higher energy peak in the IR spectrum as opposed to the one in the south of the gas. Okay, question C, show how the concentration of salicylic acid changes with time in a graph. So salicylic acid is a reactant, so if we were to plot concentration versus time, that graph would look like this. So this is our concentration of salicylic acid. Okay, so it'll look something like that. Part B, to make this reaction go faster, you use sulfuric acid as a catalyst. To draw a reaction energy diagram, so for that one. You'll plot a reaction energy diagram. So you plot energy on the y-axis and the progress of reaction. which is also called the reaction coordinate on the x-axis. So it said earlier in that problem that this reaction is slow and exothermic. So since it's exothermic, the energy of the reactants is higher than the energy of the product. So note that this difference represents delta H of the reaction. That's less than zero. So this is a slow reaction, so note that this represents our activation energy. For the uncatalyzed reaction, for the catalyzed reaction, the catalyst will lower the activation energy. Okay, so this is going to be the activation energy for the catalyzed reaction, so this one represents the uncatalyzed, and this one represents the catalyzed reaction. So what you want to do is show that the activation energy for the catalyzed reaction is lower than the activation energy for the uncatalyzed reaction. Okay, part E. Your ester product from part A undergoes hydrolysis. So this reaction goes backwards or in the reverse direction to reform the reactants. Is the reverse reaction faster or slower than the reaction of salicylic acid and one propene three all. And note that this is the ester plus the water. And then the reactants, this is the salicylic acid plus the alkene. So for the reaction to go backwards, it's going to go from the ester plus water all the way over our activation energy barrier 
to the reactors again. Note that if one is going backwards, the activation energy, is it bigger or smaller than the forward direction? It's bigger. Therefore, the reverse reaction, is it faster or slower? It's slower. Okay, so again, going backwards, the products have to undergo or overcome this larger activation energy barrier to reach it to the other side. And that means the reaction is slower. Note also that the reverse direction or the reverse reaction is endothermic because the, the S plus water is lower in energy than the salicylic gas plus the alcohol. So it turns out that these reaction energy diagram can give you quite a bit of information about a reaction. Okay, are there any questions on question three? Okay, let's go into question four. And this one I do with the ionic clock reaction. So part A, at time equals zero, one mole of I of I and one mole of uh, HSO3 minus ion are injected into one liter container that's completely filled with water. One second later before the reaction is complete, the contents of the container are analyzed for the number of